seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. And if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Our text is verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the theme for this morning's message is, if we want to be the missional church that we are, we need to be poor in spirit. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, how humble are you? How humble are you towards God? Maybe the younger ones among us can remember what you read in 1 Samuel 3, where the Lord calls Samuel, and Samuel thinks it's Eli calling him. And so Samuel goes to Eli and he says, here I am. And that happens a few more times. And then Eli says to Samuel, the next time that happens, just say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, wouldn't you call that being humble 
towards God. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I think the younger ones will also remember what happened when the angel visited Mary. And she told Mary that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. And Mary then said to the angel, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary was completely available to what God wanted to do in her life, yeah, literally in her life, and through her life. Now, wouldn't you call that being humble towards God, being receptive to His voice? As you read that at home, many of you at the mealtimes, right, and you come to church, and uh, you listen to a scripture reading, and then the minister preaches a message on a text, and you're all sitting here saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And then when the minister encourages you to do something in the name of Christ, you all say, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, that's true humility towards God. And we're not even finished. What about true humility towards yourself? John writes in chapter 1, Out of His fullness we have received grace upon grace. And Jesus in John 15 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. Is that what is true in your life as a Christian and in the life of this congregation? That you're always going to Jesus. You're always going to Him for grace, forgiving grace, liberating grace, healing grace, enabling grace, whatever grace it may be. It's all one grace, but you can look at it as a diamond with all different aspects. You're always going to Jesus for grace because you know that apart from Jesus you can't do anything. Now that's being humble towards yourself. And how humble are you towards other people? The people sitting beside you and on the chairs. Your brothers and sisters in your home. Your wife your husband. How often do you put the interest of the other before the interest of your own? If you do that by the grace of God, you're manifesting true humility towards the other. Now our text <clears throat> is also about being humble. It's being about, it is about being poor in spirit. And that means humble. It means something more, but I'm going to save that for just a bit later in the sermon. For now, it is sufficient that poor in spirit means being humble. And our text is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And if you want to know what the theme of the Sermon on the Mount is, it's tied into that word righteousness. That's why I added those verses I could have stopped at the end of verse 16, but I added 17, 18, 19, and 20 because they speak about the righteousness of God. And so if I wanted to preach a sermon on the whole Sermon on the Mount, which I would never do because it's such a rich sermon, but if I did that, I could have as a theme, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need to practice the righteousness of God. That would be the theme for the whole three chapters. And perhaps righteousness of God is a little, still a little bit abstract for you. Well, practicing the righteousness of God means living in such a way that does justice, justice, righteousness, right? They're kind of synonymous, synonymous. Does justice to your relationship with God. 
and your relationship with yourself and your relationship with other people and your relationship with creation. You don't have to be a tree hugger, right, to also say we need to be rightly related to creation. And I've already told you now, rightly related. That really is what righteousness of God is all about. And in teaching this being rightly related, Jesus is functioning here in the Sermon on the Mount as a second Moses. Children, remember that Moses went up on the mountain, right? And up on the mountain, God told Moses all sorts of things. He told him about the righteousness of God, how to be rightly related to God, to yourself, to others and creation. And he comes down from the mountain, right? And he tells the people about this righteousness of God. The Ten Commandments is a manifestation of the righteousness of God. And then chapter 21 and chapter 22 and chapter 23 of Exodus are all elaborations on the Ten Commandments, and they're all different facets of the righteousness of God. And Jesus, yeah, he doesn't go up on a mountain, he just sits on a mountain. And as he's sitting on the mountain, he is preaching to the people the righteousness of God. How to be re rightly related in those four dimensions that I shared with you a number of times. But at the same time, we should realize that Jesus is more than Moses. Jesus is teaching or preaching a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. And Jesus explains that later in chapter 5, verse 21 and following. You have heard that the men of old said, you shall not murder. And then comes the exceeding righteousness. What does Jesus say? But I say to you, if you are already angry in your heart with your neighbor, if you think in your heart, oh, the other person is such an idiot, right? You have already committed murder. You see how that exceeds the righteousness that Moses taught and that the Pharisees and the scribes practiced. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And now comes the exceeding righteousness. Yeah, but I say to you, if you look lustfully at someone from the other gender, you have already committed adultery in your heart. See, this is the exceeding righteousness. This is the righteousness that leads to the coming kingdom of heaven. Jesus says so beautifully and so, yeah, to the point, he says, unless you practice this exceeding righteousness, the stuff that goes on in your heart, right? Not just living by the letter, but all of the stuff that goes on in your head, in your heart. Unless you practice that, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. It's kind of scary, isn't it? But that's why we need Jesus, right? But he does say that. So, our text is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Our text is also part of the church being salt and light. Now, salt is not interesting in itself. I could have taken a little prop along here, a little salt shaker, and could have held it up, especially in the light, you know, and say, look, look at all these white grains of salt. And I could have poured them onto my hand. You know, look, look at this. Isn't this interesting? You know, why don't I take my, uh, you know, my smartphone out and take a little picture of that, I'm going to post it on my Instagram. I'm going to call it still life, you know? Grains of salt. Well, salt is not interesting for itself. Salt is meant for its environment, right? 
The people in those days didn't have freezers, didn't have refrigerators. So how are you going to keep your meat good? Well, you have to, you have to throw salt in there. A lot of indigenous people still do that. They throw salt in their fish, you know, to keep the salt, keep the fish good. So salt is for your environment. And I could have taken a light bulb along, you know, and held up this light bulb. Isn't it beautiful? And then somehow it's plugged in yet too, and it's on. And you go through the same kind of thing with the, the, the cell phone. Isn't that beautiful? Another still life, a light bulb. Isn't that interesting? But a light bulb is not interesting for itself. It's only interesting if it functions for its environment. If it lights up the environment. And now you see the link to the church. Because Jesus is speaking to the disciples there. Not just the twelve, but the other ones as well. And they are the nucleus of the church. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. The church is not interesting in itself. You know, take a picture of you guys sitting here, you know, first time in this new building and you post it on Facebook. Isn't this interesting? They have a new church, you know. Well, that has a place, okay? So if you want to post that, that's fine. It has a place. But it's not interesting in itself. You are only interesting for your environment. The church, the DNA of the church is missional. You can't say to yourself, well, we want to be a missional church. Yeah, I know you want to be that. But you are a missional church. Okay? You feel the difference? You are a missional church. And that was already the case in the Old Testament. You hear that in the words of Psalm 67. Lord, bless us so that we can be a blessing for the nations. God says to Abraham, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The church is missional in its DNA. And the church is missional by embodying the Beatitudes. Also the Beatitude of being poor in spirit. That's why I chose this theme, if we want to be the missional church that we are, we need to be poor in spirit. The kids can understand that, right? I mean, some boys, they want to be a, when they grow up, they want to be a firefighter, a fireman, right? Well, if you're a fireman, you got to act like a fireman, right? Other people want to be an NHL hockey player. Well, if you're an NHL hockey player, then be, play like an NHL hockey player, right? If we are a missional church, we got to act like a missional church. And the whole Bible, the whole Bible is full of examples of how the church can live for its environment. Be a missional church. Well, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah, that word blessed can have different levels of meaning. So I had, to, I had to make a decision what it means here. And my decision was that blessed here means you are divinely happy because by being poor in spirit, your life opens up and blossoms and flourishes. So all these beatitudes, all these blessings, I'm picking the interpretation that we are blessed because this is the recipe for a fruitful life. And when we, yeah, when we have this recipe and we embody this recipe for a fruitful life, we are divinely happy. And you're perfectly in your right to ask me why I picked that interpretation? Well, I thought of Psalm 1. I think all these Beatitudes parallel Psalm 1 very nicely. Blessed is the man, right? Blessed is the woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, 
does not stand in the way of sinners, right? Does not sit in the seat of scoffers, but, hey, the big thousand dollar but, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And it on this law he meditates day and night. And then it comes. He is like a fruitful tree planted by streams of water, bearing its fruit in season, its leaf does not wither. All that he does, he prospers. Or you could go to Psalm 32. Blessed is the man or the woman whose sins are forgiven, right? To whom God does not count his iniquity. All these blessings, right? We're living life the way it was meant to be lived. Our life becomes fruitful when we live it according to God's pattern. And part of God's pattern is that we are poor in spirit. You know, you know what that reminds you of? Reminds you of the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine how blessed Adam and Eve were when they lived in communion with God? Were rightly related to God, to themselves, to each other, and to creation. That, that was a manifestation of the righteousness of God in the Garden of Eden. And ever since the fall into sin, humanity has tried to recover, to regain this bliss of Eden. That's why you have all these philosophers saying, you know, if you live your life this way, it'll lead to a heaven on earth. It'll lead to a utopia. It'll solve all your problems, right? Black lives matter, right? And they do matter, of course. But you know, if you espouse that philosophy, oh, it'll just lead to a better world, right? There's an echo. There's an echo in every human heart trying to regain the righteousness and the happiness and the blessed life of the garden. But humanity, humanity is so foolish, that's what they are, they try to regain this blessed life of the garden. Yeah, they wouldn't call it the garden. It's just a secularized version of life in the garden, right? They, they're so foolish, they try to regain this without God. They build a buffer called the buffered self, the buffered self, a buffer between God and themselves. And they imagine, they imagine they don't need grace. They don't need forgiveness. They don't espouse that in Jesus, you know, out of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. They don't believe that Jesus is the vine and they're a branch and that apart from Jesus they can't do anything. They don't believe that. They think they can do this on their own. And so instead of considering themselves to be poor in spirit, they consider themselves to be rich in spirit. But instead, instead of living a life that is, considers itself to be rich in spirit, a life that considers itself to be self-sufficient, instead of that kind of an attitude, that kind of a life leading to the flourishing of life, it leads to the unraveling of life. It leads to the death of life. Every time you turn on your TV, especially the news channels, then this, and then that misery, and all sorts of misery, as I shared with you about creation groaning, a lot of that goes back to not wanting to live according to God's agenda for life. Being poor in spirit and not considering yourself to be rich in spirit. And Israel, Israel in Jesus' day, fundamentally was no different. 
It also considered itself to be rich in spirit. We have been elected by God. We are the chosen people of God. We are supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, a teacher of the blind. God lives among us. God has made covenants with us. We are the people of God. We are rich in spirit. Israel, instead of seeing all these privileges, being elected by God, having been given the law of God, the instruction of God, instead of seeing these things as blessings, according to Psalm 67, Lord, bless us so that we may be a blessing to the nations. We exist for the world. Israel actually thought that the world, the Gentiles, existed for them. And now over against, over against this attitude of feeling yourself to be rich in spirit, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are humbly dependent upon the Father. And I told you I'd come back to that. Because actually it means just a little bit more than humble. Jesus is using a word here that is used for a beggar. Blessed are you if you're a beggar. Now in Langley I see him all the time. Beggars. You know, there's signs that say no panhandling here, right? And they take off their coat and they put it over the no panhandling sign. And they merrily stand there. Sometimes they have a piece of cardboard, you know. They even have God bless you on there, you know. Please help me, right? Scruffy looking people often. May not have had a shower for weeks. They look pretty helpless. They're completely dependent upon the grace of other people. So it seems. Because they, uh, they often do have their cell phone. And they do often smoke, so yep, maybe they have a bit more than they let on that they do. But, but they are helpless-looking people. And Jesus picks a word like that for the beggar, because there were a lot of beggars in Jesus' day. right? And he says, blessed are you if you are a spiritual beggar. A spiritual beggar. Blessed are you if you live your life on your knees. Yeah, your body matters. You know, it's probably a good custom to go on your knees when you pray. Your body matters. Because when you're on your knees and you pray to God, you, you actually feel it in your body that you are dependent. And that's why I always like churches where there are kneeling benches. There are churches where you can actually get on your knees and kneel after the reading of the law. It gives you this real feeling from, Lord, have mercy upon me. But if you don't want to do that, that's fine. I'm just saying it's beneficial. It's not necessary. It's beneficial to do that. But blessed are you, says Jesus. Blessed are you if you live your life on your knees, totally dependent upon the Lord your God. Because that leads to a life of flourishing. Your life will flourish like that. I know there are exceptions that, you know, God puts pain into your life, but the general drift of the Bible is your life will flourish. And you will be divinely happy when you live that kind of a life. And why is that the case? In addition to what I told you? Because Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus uses that term, he means the new heaven and the new earth. This is the righteousness of God that leads to the new heaven 
and the new earth, God will say, welcome home, you know, faithful servant, right? What you've done, blessed are you by the grace of God. It leads to that new heaven and a new earth where our life will flourish like it never flourished before. And you and I will experience a divine happiness that we will never have known here on this earth. And the more, the more we are poor in spirit today, the more you and I experience a foretaste of this divine happiness today. Remember I told you we are the first installment, right, of the life of the new heaven and the new earth. And every Sunday, as a spiritual discipline, you get to remind yourself of that. Well, the more we are poor in spirit today, the more we have a first installment and a second installment and a third installment of this divine, the fullness of divine happiness and fruitfulness that awaits us on the other side of the horizon. And the more, the more we are the missional church, that we, we are already because we embody the righteousness of God. And the world sees, the world sees that when people are humble towards God, towards themselves, towards each other, and towards creation, that they're happy and that their life opens up and blossoms. And why is this seeing so important? Because the church is the interpretation of the gospel. The church is the interpretation of the gospel. Remember that when you embark on your Bible study seasons, Bible study season, and you dig into the Word, you want to understand the Word better. But you know what is the test case? You know what is the test case for you and me having understood what the Bible says? What is the test case? What is the acid test? Whether we've understood something. Whether we can embody it. Whether it transforms our lives. That is the test case. And so it's important that the world sees because we are the interpretation of the gospel. And for those who like difficult words, we are the hermeneutic of the gospel. That's what we are. And for the children, for the children, we are the show and tell of the gospel. Now imagine if your grandfather went to Russia and he brought talking especially to the girls now, and he brought you back a Russian doll, right? You know a Russian doll. It's called a matroshka. Not a babushka, but a matroshka. And your, your opa brought you back a Russian doll. And you go to school and you tell the kids, you know, my opa brought me back this Russian doll. And they say, we want to see it. Can you take it along? Can you show us? And so a week later or the next day, you take this Russian doll back to school and you, you show them this Russian doll and you say, you know what? And you take the top off and there's another Russian doll inside. And you take that Russian doll out and you open, there's another one. There's about nine or ten Russian dolls in one big Russian doll. Can I hang on to it? Can I touch it? Right? That's how the kids are. Well, we are the show and tell of the gospel. The world wants to know whether you have understood the gospel. If you say, Jesus changes my life, you can expect them to ask, can you give me an example of how Jesus changes my life? And so it's important that the church embodies being poor in spirit so that the world can see this. That fruitfulness begins 
by being poor in spirit. Now, the question is, is that the message you are giving? As a family, as a Christian to your friends, and as a Christian congregation. Where might you need to be more dependent upon the grace of God? Children, and husbands and wife, and congregation members. Where might you need to have to say more, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The Lord Jesus Christ has been speaking to you during this whole message through my words. But now at the very end, Jesus gets, as it were, very specific, very direct. And he says, come to me. Because you know, when I lived my life here on this earth, I was poor in spirit. He was. I lived my life on my knees. I was always receptive to the voice of my Father. I was always open to His provision. I was always available to His leading. And because I was, I lived a missional life. Jesus says that. I lived a missional life. Because the life I lived embodied the righteousness of my Father. And Jesus says, I didn't do it for myself. I came down from heaven for you. I did this as your Savior, as your substitute, as your representative. Because I knew that you couldn't do this. And my father wanted it. So I came down from heaven to do it for you. And what I've done for you, I now want to do in you. As you live in my spirit. As you abide in me. As you feed on me when you take the bread of the Lord's Supper. And drink the juice or the wine. I want to do that in you as you receive out of my fullness grace upon grace. So come, says Jesus. Live in my spirit. Put me on through faith and clothe yourself with me. And a mystery will happen. The Holy Spirit will generate my own humility in your life. And you can add another word to that song. Knowing you, Jesus, right? Knowing you. You're my all. You're my everything. You're my best. You're not just my joy. You're not just my righteousness. You're also my humility. Amen.